Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dragon Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And this Tremoroid Toberween Marathon continues this week with Tremors 3 Back to Perfection. Meaning that, in the most literal way possible, Back to Perfection takes the story of Tremors back to the original setting in the town of Perfection. Released in 2001, Tremors 3 was again released many years since the previous entry, and over a decade since the original. This puts it in an interesting spot as the studio seemed to want to ensure that it did well by sticking to what people knew, while at the same time assuming that nobody actually remembered what any of that was. Aside from that, Tremors 3 actually sets up the Tremors TV series, so you've got the shift in the setting back to the original location, the movie going out of its way to remind the audience who all these characters were, placing all the pieces for a prolonged situation that cannot possibly resolve in 90 minutes, and of course, as is Tremors tradition, introducing a new creature with new abilities along the way. That sounds like a fuck ton of shit to try to pull off! So, let's take a look at Tremors 3 back to perfection and see if they manage to do so eloquently. Our story opens at night in Argentina, where we see a small news crew meet up with Bert Gummer, again played by Michael Gross. Evidently there was a graboid in the area, but after being allowed to survive long enough, it has birthed into the monsters of the second movie. Producing six Shriekers. And between movies, they double the amount of Shriekers per graboid. Or this movie fucked it up. It depends on what they do for the rest of the series. A voracious hermaphroditic life form. Asexual! Hermaphrodites have both sex organs. The point being, hermaphrodites still need to find a mate so that both of them can fertilize each other. Asexual creatures reproduce by themselves, without sex, asexually. Got it? But it's okay, he's got a plan. In fact, the news crews are part of it, driving up and leaving their engines on, producing more than enough heat to attract the horde of ravenous monsters. Obviously hearing this, they get the fuck out of there, but no bother, the creatures are very much in range for Bert's newest toy. This is the latest rated movie in the Tremors series, PG instead of PG-13, and yet it opens up with the fucking ending of Rambo. With that all-important character building out of the way, the movie immediately goes back to perfection as Bert returns home from his latest monster hunt, but is surprised to find that along with the increase in tourism, there is talk of the horrors of city development. Oh, just some real estate guys out of Reno. They want to cut up the valley into parcels. That'll be a cold day in hell. Movie characters do realize that Construction happens, right? I mean, I live out in the fucking sticks, and uh, about a year ago they knocked down that lot over there and cleared out all the trees and put a trailer up, and right now they're currently chopping down all the trees in the corner lot back there. Life goes on! As horrible as new buildings sound, Bert's perfectly fine with his own home renovations, constructing a graboid-proof concrete shell around the perimeter. What's it been? Eleven years? No reason to lower your guard. You would think that one of the men who was up on the rock at the end of the first movie and knows very well what the fuck these things can do, and that they have had several other outbreaks of graboids in the world since then, and that they are known to have access to this area, wouldn't be so quick to dismiss the possibility of another graboid attack. Enough of established characters like Miguel, played by Tony Gennaro, it's time to introduce the new shopkeep, Jody Chang, played by Suzanne Shuang. She's the niece of Walter Chang, so it's not like the city just went out and looking for someone Asian to fill the role. The studio did that. While the existence of man-eating monsters has been quite the boon for commercialization, most of Bert's new purchases don't have quite as much to do with monster fanboyism. It continuously updates its time to the nanosecond uh -huh. by connecting directly to the cesium clock in Colorado via ultrasonic frequency. And despite me just losing my shit over your barcode reader, I have no qualms with me being connected 24-7 with some government technology, as long as it's for a really neat watch. As we still have yet to introduce a crisis, or finish with all the character intros, let's split 150-50 with Jack Sawyer, played by Sean Christian. A new face in town, he's making a living by driving truckloads of tourists out into the desert to experience the gut-wrenching tension of a real Graboid safari. Now, as I said, we're in the heart of Graboid country. Right in the heart of it! And these here are special Graboid variants that don't come after you when your engine's making noise, but after it stops. 
Unsurprisingly, this is not a graboid, but instead Jack's dumb shit partner in crime, Buford, played by Billy Ryak. It's an obvious enough ploy. He scares the crap out of everyone, traps them on a boulder where they have to wait with nothing but the desert wind and some overpriced refreshments for company. And everyone gets to go home thinking they barely survived a graboid encounter. We also establish that there's some proto-relationships going on between Jack and Jody and Jack and Mindy. I think Jack was expecting you to sew those pants, not just stick tape on them. Mom. Tape is a total statement. People like Jack and I understand that. Yeah, that duct tape fashion. You remember that from the early 2000s? No? Well, at least they get to show it off at Perfection High School. It doesn't exist. So yeah, Ariana Richards returns as Mindy Sterngood, and Charlotte Stewart again plays her mother, Nancy. All of this establishes that while Perfection has become a tourist destination in the decades since the incident, that doesn't mean that Bert even remotely likes any of the new faces around town. Between Jack being the guy he's obviously going to have to team up with later, and Buford's only character trait being that he is a reprehensible human being. Do you have to keep doing that? You don't enjoy my company, huh? You know, a man could take offense at that. Just about all his screen time has been establishing he's stupid, pervy, or both. It's almost like the whole time is just the movie trying to set him up to be the first... Oh, I'm not sure why the Graboid resurfaced after getting a hold of him, but they cleared that up pretty well. Now faced with an actual crisis with an actual Graboid, of course Jack has no fucking idea what the hell he's doing. Fortunately, Mindy is here to point out how to distract the thing, and TV trash Shroudy Seymour can complain about the quality of this movie. What the hell? This thing's not even real! Hey, everybody shut up! Who's that? Shut up and listen to him! Who's that other shut, shut the hell up! up! If I keep this up, I can kiss any chances of a crossover with that man goodbye. Distracting the monster with some random junk and an expensive-ass DSLR, the group escapes while the seismographs provide Bert with enough warning to activate the Graboid Alarm, alerting the town to the whole threat so he can ride up with his bullpup rifle and show how much of a badass he is. Things like the size of a whale. Yep, I've seen them. And I know well, this gun won't do diddly, but it looks cool as hell. Of course, Bert does wonder why no one else's Graboid detector warned them. I think the batteries are dead or something. Uh, Come on, Bert! It's been, what, 11 years? I'm wondering why the hell he relied on battery packs for machines permanently affixed by the main power lines. Uh, no bother, he can always rely on Miguel to provide Graboid data. Bert, that aerial thing, it, it got bent, man. I, I've been meaning to fix it. It's a shame Heather didn't get back together with Bert between movies. Aside from the fact that, you know, Reba McIntyre, and also awesome fucking character and super fucking bad, she would actually have provided some fucking help in preparing for this fucking situation. As nobody but Bert has any data on the creatures whatsoever, they know that there are three Graboids in the valley, and the basic heading they're taking, but nobody knows how long they've been active, and therefore can't be sure when they will metamorphosize into Shriekers. Nancy says they can call for help, but Bert believes that there's no time, and they must kill the Graboids now. We hunt them down. We wipe them out. We go at dawn. That way, we can all get some Egg McMuffins. A McDonald's serves breakfast all day now. They are? Well, shit, let's go! The Graboid hunt is planned out the same as the last movie. Drive some RC cars around and blow the sons of bitches up when they take the bait. Seems easy enough. So obviously the feds have to show up and make an arbitrary obstacle. I'm enforcing an immediate ban on all hunting of Graboids in Perfection Valley. Turns out Graboids are an endangered species. I mean, they drove them to extinction like three times now and they keep coming back. But endangered? Yeah, endangered. The only thing that's going to endanger this species is low movie sales. But they're not heartless, sadistic bastards. They do have a backup plan in case the Graboid problem is too dangerous for the locals. We're prepared to evacuate Perfection Valley, seal it off indefinitely. Wait a minute. You'd make us leave? That, that's not why I called you. With Bert being proven right time and time again over the last decade, are you really this surprised that calling the government turned out to provide negative results? This means that even with the Graboids coming right up to his front door, 
Bert can't take them out without risking his freedom and that of the whole valley. But there's another twist. The guys want to get a live one for scientific research. Jack manages to convince the feds that Bert will help them catch a graboid, with the understanding that after they get the specimen, he will be given free reign to hunt down and kill all remaining graboids in the valley. Of course, Bert didn't know anything about this deal until after it was made, so he brings Jack along for the hunt. Interestingly enough, though, the government agents made some scientific discoveries on the side anyway. It's an egg. I've proven they come from eggs. They also explained that the egg was 300 years old, but the graboid yolk was new, which explains why it can exist from the Precambrian area, and yet they don't go around eating everyone all the time. Sorta. And it's still really doesn't make sense, but... Uh, yeah, but participation trophy! We're not done introducing characters and plot points yet, though, as when out on the hunt, who would happen to show up but Melvin, now a real estate mogul, again played by Robert Jane. It turns out he's the one trying to develop Perfection Valley and capitalize on the assured spike in property value. People are folding, Bert. And I got this whole county in my pocket. You can't hold out forever. I was born to hold out. So Mel is a bad guy, because he wants people moving into perfection, which is bad. And the feds are bad guys, because they want people moving out of perfection, which is bad. And the graboids are showing up without permission, which is bad. But then they eat people, and that equalizes the population, which is good. Wouldn't you know it, a graboid just so happens to be right there. And at this point, Melvin's beeper goes off. This kind of screws up their plan to capture, as Bert winds up trapped between the car and the graboid, with only the barrel to prevent... Oh. Oh, never mind. Didn't prevent that at all. Houston, we have a problem. Oh god, the lack of oxygen is already disorienting the man. Ever the badass, Bert gives instructions to Jack from within the graboid's stomach, leading him back to Bert's base with the anti-graboid perimeter. This, plus a motherfucking chainsaw, is all they need to rescue the man. This does mean that they are one graboid down, which is bad, or good, or neutral? I don't even know anymore. Probably won't be hearing any complaints from the feds anytime soon, as only one man is to limp back to town with a harrowing tale of how he and the others found a graboid on the surface. They were getting ready to bring it in, but suddenly, Triggers burst forth from the beast, killing everyone. He tried to escape with a fire extinguisher full of shaving cream, but alas, it turns out he has a really hot ass. Yo. So the feds were bad, so this is good? But now instead of the feds, we get Shriekers. So, and how do Shriekers stack up against federal agents for how badly they fuck things up? No bother, Bert is here to kill all the monster asses. Now when Shriekers first emerge, there are only six of them. I have to say that six does make a lot more sense coming out of a creature the size of a graboid, but they also say that the tentacles are what become the Shriekers, and the graboids only have three of them. Tracking the beasts with infrared satellite technology, because he's got that, they determine the Shrieker count is up to seven. Nevertheless, Jody and Miguel have joined the party, so they head out to take down the Shriekers. Very fortunately, the things have all trapped themselves in a small valley with nowhere to run. Less fortunate is what followed them there. Graboids! I'm just happy that they remembered that Graboids can easily destroy a truck. I mean, the characters are all fucked and are gonna die, but I'm sure they're feeling nostalgic glee at the same time. The group manages to jump on the nearby boulders, but left their radio equipment on the cars. This means there's nothing to do but spout exposition about how this graboid, whom Miguel calls El Blanco, is an albino, just like one of his old goats who couldn't reproduce. Sterile, huh? Maybe that's why El Blanco hasn't turned into low shriekers. Albinos aren't sterile. You can be albino and sterile, but nothing about being albino makes you sterile. Unless you sunburn your dick off, I guess. But that's the excuse the movie has for establishing that graboids become shriekers, but wanting to have a graboid that stays a graboid forever. Anyway, they MacGyver up a fishing pole to retrieve a radio, and call in a diversion to get El Blanco off their butts. So the monster will either go for the radio, or run for the hills. Either way. Thus, they can prepare to move in and take out the Shrieker Menace. One bomb later, they rush the valley, only to find the Shriekers have already left, in a way. Looks like the 
shed some kind of husk or skin. As if cicadas weren't annoying enough, now there's giant carnivorous versions. That's just fucking great. The movie doesn't waste any time introducing the new step in the graboid life cycle, which is, again, mostly CGI. So. Also above ground, and sees heat, and can't hear. Really not that much more interesting than Shriekers. What's it doing now? Okay, uh, I, I can admit when I'm wrong. They have a shootout with the sci-fi original series quality CGI, but much to their horror. <laughs> a beloved character has died. Yes, I questioned why he even survived the first movie, but now is not the time. Right now, we have to rattle off the biological traits for this creature. Spotting a graboid egg, this completes the known life cycle of the creature. Also, in case you were wondering where that fire came from... Well, look at that. Look at that right there. It reacts with the air. Jack, it, it reacted when the two liquids touched. I mean, oxygen is probably needed for the fire, but it's not the reactive part. Do you even butt chemistry? This is all well and good, but what do they call these creatures? Okay, last offers. Or butt launchers. That's better, huh? Oh, oh, ass blasters. How's that? This also marks the only time in a Tremors movie where they actually name them in the movie they appear in. I mean, they named Graboids in the first Tremors movie, Graboids, but it wasn't really official until the second movie. Despite El Blanco still being on the loose, the guys have no problem hoofing it back to Bert's place. Problem is, while his base is Graboid and trigger-proof, he didn't count on flying carnivorous monsters coming in to crash his party, so everyone retreats into the safe room. Okay, how long can we wait it out in here? Six, seven years, depending on how well you maintain your dietary discipline. Longer if we sacrifice Jack for the greater good. No time for that, though, as the ass blaster is busting flaming ass on the door and will break in any moment. But don't worry, his secret escape has a secret escape. What happens if this thing eats your food? Ass blaster blitzkrieg. That's what you get for stocking up on all those damn bushes baked beans. Not wanting to face an army of ass blasters, Bert quickly sets a trap for the creature, destroying his house, but ensuring the safety of the town. Fire should reach my stock of reloading powder right about now. All those emergency supplies in your safe room, yet you never thought to keep a rifle in there. You could have just avoided this whole mess. Or, as we find out shortly after, thanks to Nancy and Mindy, just let the damn things eat the MREs. Unlike Shriekers, ass blasters don't puke out more of them after eating. They just fall asleep. What kind of supreme being would condone such irony? Well, if you ask Kevin Smith, she's actually up there laughing her ass off about it. Problem is, they've only managed to take care of three ass blasters, and there were seven Shriekers at the time of the metamorphosis, so they must run like hell, right into the junkyard, where things turn into a game of pre-Cambrian cat and mouse. Well, let's assess the situation. There are four flying monsters with flaming thought powers trying to kill us, and we are literally in deep shit. They come up with a plan of attack. As Bert's arsenal is currently shrapnel surrounding a crater, they must whip up a firearm out of the slightly better conditioned scrap in the junkyard. Thus, everyone splits up and grabs what pieces they can for the barrel, trigger mechanism, projectiles, and propellant. Like a Borderlands quest. An old friend Nestor was killed in the first Graboid incursion. His trailer ended up here. He loved his shine. It's just too bad we never took the time to establish it back then. Also, very fortunate that in these 11 years, no one ever raided his house for the free alcohol. With that, they lure and fire at the ass blasters, taking out two of them, no problem. However, one is not quite as stupid as its brethren. Sons of bitches are always on a learning curve. Or at least when it's convenient for the plot, which, if the last movie is anything to go by, isn't very often. This results in a climactically close call, but a spare fuse is enough to turn the ass blaster into a bomb itself. Ignoring, of course, that they already showed that it's the two reactive chemicals that did that, so the puncture itself would have caused it to blow up, if anything, but never mind that. The ass blaster is dead. Now they just have to worry about El Blanco. How the hell does he always know where I am? Watch. Some have noted that this is a silly goof. After all, his watch is only tuned to the cesium clock. The cesium clock in Colorado is what's emitting the ultrasonic frequency. His watch, instead, has an internal antenna that is tuned to that frequency, vibrating fast enough to detect it. And of course, Graboids hunt by detecting vibration. So really! 
With comically bad luck, Bert gets flung out of the trailer and onto the wrong end of the spring mattress, latching onto all his tactical pouches. Everyone must hurry to save him as El Blanco draws near, but oh no, the final ass blaster has arrived, ready to kill the fuck out of everyone. This means they can use the plot relevant tape from earlier with a plot relevant watch to stick the timepiece to the ass blaster, tricking El Blanco into eating the other monster, inadvertently saving Bert's life. Uh, on the off chance, uh, El Blanco's coming back for seconds. Want to get me off this thing? And of course, considering it was a chemical reaction that would cause the explosions, an ass blaster being eaten whole by a graboid like that after being you know, digested and stuff, it would kind of burst just as well as an RC car with a grenade strapped to it, but <laughs> that's only if you want to be consistent. Point is, happy ending! Most of the town survived, the feds died, Nancy and Mindy make a ton of money selling their captured ass blaster to Siegfried and Roy, and El Blanco is still terrorizing the countryside. As long as one of these reptilians is still alive, this whole area is deemed protected. No houses, no condos, no grand chefs. Which sets up the Tremors TV series that I still don't have. But anyway, it does explain why there's a Graboid in town, why it stays a Graboid, and why they can't just kill it. But in any case, that was Tremors 3, Back to Perfection. And it does a lot of things, none of them particularly well. My main issue with Tremors 3 is there is so damn much going on, and the movie pulls itself in all sorts of directions trying to do so much at once that it never takes much time to do a good job with what it has. One could say that it feels like a really long episode of a TV series, and while at times it may come off this way, it has far too many other things going on to really pull that off smoothly either. Aside from setting up the TV series, Tremors 3 spent a long time establishing the pre-established setting. Yes, it's been over a decade since Tremors came out, but you don't have to spend this long establishing all the little details again. Or at the very least, not shoehorning every minor character back into the plot of this movie. Then, of course, the movie has to introduce a new stage for the creature. It's interesting enough, but aside from them flying, I don't find it quite as interesting as the previous two forms. Yes, they lay graboid eggs, but they feel a lot like Shriekers again. Hell, even have the same infrared sight. As much as I can complain, though, Tremors 3 does weave a story together that is interesting enough. The acting is all over the place, and the CGI is what you'd expect out of a TV series and not a movie, but it can be entertaining if you give it a chance and forgive its very strong shortcomings, coming in at two graboid comic books out of five. It was really hard to choose between a 2 and a 3 for this movie. And it's a high 2 or a low 3. And it's times like this when a 2.5 would come in very handy, but I'm not anxious to start fucking up and adding decimal points to the rest of my reviews and overcomplicating things just to make the off chances if I have a movie like this slightly more convenient. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I've been Dr. Shadow. And remember, development is bad. So is abandonment. So just stop fucking doing anything. People call me paranoid. I don't think you're paranoid. I do, but not no more. <laughs>